gonna ask you guys to pray in your hearts and uh, we'll see what the Lord does in the second half of our gathering. And so Father, we wanna say uh, thank you to you. Lord, we know that every good gift, every, good, every perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. We thank you that you are consistent, that you are the Lord and you change not. We're grateful, Lord, that you promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And so, Father, I pray that as you continue to do that here, that you help us to be all in. Lord, all in for all the ministries of our church, including our amazing Christian school. And so, Father, we commit all these things to you. We pray for little hearts next door in our kids' ministry as they learn about you on their level and all of us here as well. Lord, we open our hearts now and we ask for you to speak and we ask all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. All right, so we are in a very, very practical part of the Word of God studying the Gospel of Matthew and specifically the Sermon on the Mount. And so while Matthew presents Jesus as the king, we know that the Sermon on the Mount tells us how the king wants us to live. And so by way of review from last week, the Sermon on the Mount can be called the king's royal decree. Who's the king? His name is Jesus. What's his royal decree? It's the greatest sermon ever given, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. If you have the lead, uh, red letter edition, uh, all those red letters spanning those three chapters. Now the good news is that if you have genuinely turned to Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of your life, you've turned from your sins, you've turned to Jesus as your only hope, the only way for the salvation of your soul. You've given your life to Christ. The good news is you are a citizen of his kingdom. You are a citizen now of his spiritual kingdom and you will one day be a citizen of his physical kingdom. But here's the bottom line, that as you continue as a citizen of the kingdom, as long as you continue to take the king's royal decree seriously, as long as you continue to visit it and exegete it and ask God to help you apply it to your life, what are you doing as you're living for the king for the rest of your life? By doing that, you're showing your love for him. You're showing your loyalty to the king. But just the opposite is true as well. That if you're here today or watching and for some reason you don't really care about the Sermon on the Mount, you don't really care about the king's royal decree, what are you doing? You are showing your lack, your lack of love and loyalty to the king and it's just that simple. It's very, very simple. And so my, my question to anybody who says, I don't really care about the Sermon on the Mount, I don't really care about Jesus' words, my question to you is, have you ever met the king? Because he really is risen, he really is real, and if you'll give your life to him, he really will change your life. Absolutely, a thousand percent. Now in our text today, Jesus will once again use the phrase, and I quote, you have heard that it has been said, but I say to you. He used that phrase three times last week as we studied verses 21 through 32. He's gonna use that term three more times this week as we finish up Matthew chapter five, studying verses 33 through 48. Now, by using that phrase, you have heard that it has been said, but I say to you, by using that phrase, Jesus was not trying to change the word of God. Jesus was not trying to go back into the Old Testament and change the law that God had given in the Old Testament. No way. Opposed to that is this truth. By saying, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, Jesus was trying to get us to open our eyes and see the original intent of the Old Testament law. And what intent is that? It is that God wants us to keep his moral law both outwardly, and can you guys please say the last word there? Inwardly. You gotta get that because that's what Jesus is dealing with in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, both last week and this week. God wants us to keep his moral law outwardly, yes, but just as important, inwardly. Now, most of you know we are, as Christians, not under the law. We are under grace. 
But we should never forget this as New Testament Christians. We should never forget that God's moral law that he gave in the Old Testament has been repeated in the New Testament. (laughs) Therefore, we as New Testament Christians should realize that, hey, since that moral law has been repeated in the New Testament, we need to keep that law. And we can't can't keep it in our own strength. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. How many of you are glad that when Jesus went up, the Spirit came down? Right? The same, I say it every week, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, if you're born again, lives inside of you and lives inside of me. So we need to keep the moral law. And as we do, just remember this, don't just do it outwardly, make sure you're doing it inwardly. You say, why is that important? Because ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, say amen here. If your heart's right, your behavior will be right. You see that? If you and I have the right inward disposition on the inside, we're gonna have the right outward behavior on the outside. And that's what Jesus is driving home here. Now last week, King Jesus warned us about the dangers of those wrong inward dispositions like anger and lust and unfaithfulness. We covered that last week. Today, our king is speaking again. And what is he doing in this section of the sermon? He is warning us once again about the wrong inward dispositions of deception, revenge, and hatred. Specifically, deception in oath-taking And not just that, but personal vengeance when it comes to being insulted and wanting to get back at people and then hating our enemies. All right, so right now, if you're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, can you please say amen so I know you're there with me? Okay, so here we go. Our king, King Jesus, said this. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Now, which Old Testament law did Jesus just refer to? Well, he's reaching back into the Old Testament. If you're new to the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's called Torah. It's also known as the Pentateuch. It's the law of Moses. 1500 B.C., And so Moses wrote, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I would add, you shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Now the word swear there is not talking about using profanity. It's not talking about cussing, right, or using foul language. By the way, if you have a problem with profanity, cussing, using foul language, you don't have a mouth problem, you have a heart problem, because Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you need to do is you need to get your heart right before the Lord so that he comes in by his spirit, changes your heart so that your words build people up as opposed to tearing people down. None of that was in the notes. That's all for free. All right. So we're not talking about that in this part of the Bible. What we're talking about is swearing oaths. So if you swear an oath in the Lord's name, but you know while you're making the oath that it's a lie, (laughs) you know while you're making the oath that you have no intention of keeping that oath, not only have you committed perjury, but you have also profaned God's holy name. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is serious. It's so serious that Jesus went on to say this. Please look at verse 34. He said again, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. And then he qualifies the statement, don't misunderstand him, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, I love this by the way, for it is the city of the great king. I love that Jesus said that Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Everybody, who's the king? What's his name? And where is he gonna reign in the future? What city? Praise the Lord, huh? I would love to get off into eschatology, but I won't. Verse 36, and do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. 
And so making a false oath is so serious that Jesus said in verse 34, do not take an oath at all. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what the Lord is is saying here. He wasn't saying you can never, ever, ever take an oath ever under any circumstances. That's not what he's saying. And the way we know that is because God's word says this. Now we're in Deuteronomy 6.13. It says, quote, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. And look at this, shall take oaths in his name. Okay, so Jesus would never contradict the word of God. Jesus would never contradict his word, which is settled forever in heaven. And so what in the world did he mean in the New Testament, specifically Matthew 5, verse 34, when he said, quote, do not take an oath at all? What did he mean? Well, if you're taking notes, this is what he meant. And I'm going to give you several kingdom citizen applicational points this morning. All right, so number one, kingdom citizens should never make, note this, frivolous oaths with the intention to deceive. Now, the reason Jesus had to teach on this is because it was being abused in his day. You see, there were some religious leaders in the first century AD, and what were they doing? They were going around, they were saying, hey, if you swear an oath in God's name, God's law is very clear, that oath is binding. But then they tried to get around God's word. And they said, but if you swear oaths in the name of lesser things, like heaven, or like earth, or like Jerusalem, or like the hairs on your head, you know, those oaths, they don't always have to be binding. So what are they doing? They're actually teaching people that frivolous oaths are okay, you can get away with it. Why? Because, hey, you swear in God's name, you better keep that oath. That's clear. That's what the law says, Deuteronomy 6.13. But it doesn't say if you swear by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or by the hairs of your head. And so they're actually teaching something where Jesus says that must never be done. Now, in case you think any, everything that I'm talking about is irrelevant, <laughs> Let me remind you that frivolous oaths are being used in our day all the time. And people will swear by so many different things. Have you guys ever heard this one? I swear on my mother's grave. Very interesting. I swear by my mother's grave. The person who feels the need to say that What kind of emotions are they trying to elicit within you so that you'll really believe them? They're trying to get you to think, ooh, his mother's grave. He must be telling the truth. Okay, I'll do this. No, he's probably not telling the truth. If somebody has to swear by their mother's grave to add legitimacy to their oath, they're probably trying to pull one over on you. And that's why Jesus said, I love it, in verse 37... Let what you say be simply yes <laughs> or no. Anything more, that from, uh, anything more than this comes from what? Evil. Wow. But somebody says, but pastor, you don't understand. If I don't swear by something, like I swear by a stack of Bibles, right? If I don't swear by something, then, then people are just not going to believe me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if that's the case, you got a big problem. It's a character problem. Because if you, have the rep- if you had the reputation of being a person, a man or a woman of integrity, then you would not need to swear at all. Your plain word would be enough. People would say, that's a man of integrity. That's a woman of integrity. So when they say yes, they mean yes. When they say no, they mean no. Is this making sense to you guys? And by the way, anything more than that, according to Jesus, comes from the devil. So we should listen to what he's saying to us And by way of review, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the King's Royal Decree. The King is Jesus. We're kingdom citizens, those who've given our lives to him. So this applies to us, every word of it. Look at verse 38. He said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. All right, stop right there. Which Old Testament law did Jesus just refer to? All right, he reaches back again to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 
1921, quote, your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now that's serious. <laughs> Again, 1500 BC, written by Moses by the uh, uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That is God's law, right? And so, why in the world did God give Israel that civil law? Well, here's why. At least two reasons. Number one, it was a very effective deterrent against crime. <laughs> if you know that's true, and you know that the government is serious, you're probably gonna think twice before you commit a crime. But then number two, the reason God gave that to Israel is because it ensured a measured punishment for crime. Regarding this, Dr. Charles Ryrie wrote, quote, the law of retaliation provided for, what kind of justice, church family? Exact justice. Look at this, I love this. Not revenge. And it concerned public justice, not private vengeance. That's a great point. So the law, an eye for an eye, was a civil law given to Israel regarding public justice. It was never, ever, ever about personal revenge or personal vengeance. And so on that note, now let's see what Jesus said in verse 39. So you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, verse 39, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And so right now we gotta put on the brakes because I got a lot to unpack with you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most misunderstood principles in the entire Bible. Turn the other cheek. I would say it's one of the most misused principles in the entire Bible. Sadly, and often, it is used, Jesus' words are used to teach pacifism. And so extreme pacifists will say any form of violence, even in wartime, is wrong. So when Nazi Germany... Back in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, when Nazi Germany was overrunning Europe, when they overran Poland, when they overran France, when they overran Greece and a bunch of other countries, according to pacifists, no one should have resisted them. The Allies should not have taken arms, taken up arms. And I think, really? And ladies and gentlemen, I just gotta tell you, as a, a person who loves history, and I didn't live back then, but as I look back and I study American history, I am so glad that when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, I am so glad that our president, FDR, was not a pacifist. I'm so glad that after his day of infamy speech, Congress declared war on Japan the very next day. I'm so glad that Congress, three days after that, uh, declared war against Germany so that America could finally join uh, England and France against the Nazis. And what if, back then, what if Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the Congress were pacifists? What if they were? Ladies and gentlemen, probably we'd all be speaking German right now. And people think I'm joking. I am not joking at all. Hitler wanted to take over the world. He wanted global dominance. The reality is, because we live in a fallen world, evil empires exist. And if we embrace pacifism, what's going to happen? The dictators of those evil empires are going to be emboldened to do the unthinkable, like slaughter six million Jews. That's what's gonna happen if we embrace pacifism, okay? And so what should responsible nations do? Responsible nations should embrace this, peace through strength. And what, what does that do? That makes sure that the evil dictators in a fallen world are always kept in check. That's what we do. Every... 
every responsible nation on the planet has the right and the responsibility to maintain a strong national defense. We have to. That's so crucial. And why is that true? Why should every responsible nation, right, uh, um, make sure that they have a strong national defense? Here's why. If you're listening, say amen. amen. Because the most loving thing a government can do for its citizens is protect us from evil. That's why. And so, ladies and gentlemen, not only do evil dictators exist, but horrible, evil terrorist organizations exist like Hamas and Hezbollah and the Islamic Jihad and the Houthis and, and the, the greatest state sponsor of terrorism, Iran. And what's going to happen with those five uh, entities if the whole nation embraces pacifism? What's going to happen is, ladies and gentlemen, you are either eventually going to have to convert to Islam or you're going to die or be thrown in prison. Does anybody, is anybody following what I'm saying this morning? Okay, and so... In case, in case you think that what I'm saying is a little bit extreme, let me, let me remind you that it's based on the word of God. And so the whole principle of turn the other cheek was never meant by Jesus to be applied to governments. And the reason I know that is because what God said through Paul in Romans chapter 13. Listen to the word of God. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. What does the Bible say? God institutes government. Verse 2, therefore whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what's good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant. So the government official is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. That does not sound like pacifism. He does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And so the whole principle of turn the other cheek should never, ever, ever be applied to government, should never, ever, ever be applied to military, should never, ever, ever be applied to law enforcement agencies. No, if you're here today and you have or are serving in one of the branches of our uh, military, you know what we say to you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for standing in the gap so that we can be protected against crazy, evil people in the world. If you're here today and you have served in the past or are currently serving as a law enforcement agent, we say... Thank you. Thank you so much. And as far as this church is concerned, you have our respect if you are a law enforcement agent. I am so glad that right now all of you can freely relax and look this way toward me because we've got some guys and some ladies uh, out there who are looking the other way to make sure our backs are covered and we're safe. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord for that. And so for the principle of turn the other cheek should not be applied to government, military, law enforcement agencies, and it should not be applied to using self-defense when necessary. Later, the Lord Jesus will tell his disciples this, and I quote, let the one who has no sword sell his cloak or his coat and buy one. Luke twenty two thirty six. Now, the reason Jesus said that at the end of his ministry to his men is because he knew, he knew he was going back to the Father, and he knew the disciples were going to be traveling a lot around the Roman Empire, and often they would be traveling on dangerous roads. And since they would be on those dangerous roads, Jesus thought that they should carry a weapon for self-defense. 
Plus, they may need that weapon in their home to protect their family. And so by saying, turn the other cheek, Jesus was not ever saying, Christians are not allowed to defend themselves. No, just the opposite. A good paraphrase of Luke twenty two thirty six. Can you see it? Jesus looking at his disciples, and here's what he said to them. Boys, are you packing? That's exactly what he said. Now, here's the thing. Some of you are a little uncomfortable right now, and you're thinking, oh, pastor, you're getting political. I'm not getting political. I'm preaching the word of God. I'm preaching the word of God. Okay? And so here's the thing. If the word of God just happens to line up with our Second Amendment, praise the Lord. And if you're here today and you got a conviction against people um, um, lawfully carrying firearms, great. You don't have to ever buy a firearm. But don't try to impose your ideas on other people who want to do that. We're in America, we're free, and we need to have the freedom to obey the word of God. I also would add that I have no problem with moms and dads ever putting your kids in things like Taekwondo class or self-defense classes. Those types of classes are gonna teach them to be strong. Those types of classes are gonna teach them to defend themselves. They're gonna instill great qualities like respect for authority and discipline and self-confidence and self-control. Does anybody think the next generation com coming up needs those four qualities in their lives? Yeah, absolutely. Man, oh man, I got the, 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 the privilege and the honor of, of uh, sharing with our high school chapel at Calvary Christian Academy last week, and I did a little bit of research, and I found out a year ago, a study said that the average American teenager spends a little less than five hours a day on social media. Moms and dads, wouldn't you rather your kids be outside or a taekwondo class or learning self-respect and uh, respect for authority and self-confidence and, and um, discipline than doing this for five hours? Moms and dads, it's time to wake up. It's time to say enough is enough. Enough's enough. Listen, you have been, you have been, um, and, um, um, What's the word I'm trying to think of? I hate when I go off my notes because I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Moms and dads, you have been charged <laughs> by the Lord to raise your kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It is not anybody's other, any other person's responsibility primarily that falls in your lap, mom and dad. So you can do a good job. You can do a good job. Now, in case you haven't heard, the principle of turn the other cheek should not be applied to government, should not be applied to the military, should not be applied to law enforcement agencies, should not even to be applied to self-defense when necessary. You say, well, what in the world should it be applied to? What was Jesus talking about? Well, if you're taking notes, here it is. Kingdom citizens should never retaliate when they're personally, what's the word? That's what Jesus was talking about. Nothing more, nothing less. Especially when it comes to being insulted for your Christian faith. We do not retaliate and we certainly never ever take personal vengeance. Why? Because God said, I am the Lord, I will repay. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But a slap in the face was essentially a personal insult, an act of great dishonor, disrespect. Now here's what we gotta come to grips with in 2024, that unless there's revival in the church soon that spills over into a spiritual awakening into our nation, what's gonna happen, as the Bible predicts, things are not gonna get better and better, they're gonna get worse and worse. And don't you understand that as things get worse and worse, that we as evangelical Christians are gonna be more and more marginalized by culture. So I'm just trying to prepare everybody. We gotta prepare ourselves for lots of personal insults. Our opponents may not actually slap us, but they will gossip behind our backs. They will uh, make jokes about us 
um, in the break room. They will post derogatory remarks against us on social media. They're going to call us every single name in the book. They maybe even slap us across the face as a personal insult for what we believe in the Bible or believe about Christ or believe about God. So what's our response when that slap comes? Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Here you go. He didn't say, turn the other cheek and then continue your circular motion so that you can do a reverse roundhouse to the person's <laughs> head. He didn't say that. He said, just turn the other cheek. Can you imagine what that witness would be? Why do we turn the other cheek, Pastor? Because kingdom citizens should never retaliate when they are personally insulted. Now, I gotta unpack this a little bit more and I'll move on. But please note that the Lord said, turn the other cheek. He didn't say, stand there and get your head beat in. It's not what it says. So again, a slap is a personal insult. It's not a brutal assault. If anybody, anywhere, anytime ever uses unlawful force against you, you gotta call 911 immediately. You got to let that person feel the full force of Romans 13, the full force of law enforcement. Why? So they'll never do that again to someone else. And you have been created in the image of God. And like I said last week, God has never called any of his image bearers to be punching bags. Okay, and so let's really make sure we're careful when we interpret Jesus' words. Look at verse 40 now. He says in verse 40, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So he wants to take your undergarment, let him have your outer garment. Verse 41, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. All right, so if you're taking notes, a good summary of those three verses is simply this. Kingdom citizens should always go the extra mile. What is the, the king, Jesus, telling his kingdom citizens? He's saying, go the extra mile. He's, he's saying, do more than what's expected of you. Do more than what's expected of you. If someone sues you and wants your shirt, give them your coat. If you live 2,000 years ago and a Roman soldier wants you to carry, carry my gear for one mile, carry it for two miles. If someone has a legitimate need and they're begging money from you, if you can meet that need, be a blessing and meet that need. If someone has a legitimate need and they want to borrow some money and you're able, lend them the money. According to Luke 6.35, Jesus went on to say, listen to this, lend expecting nothing in return. Wow. So Christian brother, when another Christian brother asks you for money for a loan, don't say, okay, but it's gonna cost you 30% interest. Don't do that. If you do that, you're violating the king's rules for us kingdom citizens. Again, Jesus said, quote, lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. Now, if anybody's here right now and they're thinking, ooh, I can take advantage of these Calvary people right now. <laughs> Notice I said legitimate need, not illegitimate greed. So the king wants us to do more than what's expected of us. Just live that lifestyle. Teach your kids to live that lifestyle. Look at verse 43. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy? All right, so time out right there. What law did Jesus just refer to? He referred to Leviticus 19:18, 18, 1500 years BC, law of Moses, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can answer out loud. What does that not say? Yeah, it doesn't say anything about hating your enemy. Because nowhere in the Old Testament does it ever say, hate your enemy. What it says is love your neighbor. Whether your neighbor's good, whether your neighbor's bad, whether your neighbor's weird, whether your neighbor's normal, just love your neighbor as yourself. 
But some Jews read that and they thought, okay, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. So the, they assumed, and by the way, we should never assume anything about anybody, but they assumed that, hey, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, then the opposite must be true and God wants me to hate my enemy. But God never said that. God just said what he said right there in Leviticus 19, 18. So Jesus had to correct the false teaching. And so he said in verse 44, you have heard that it was said, was said but I say to you, I like, I like this, love your enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, that's probably the hardest three words that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In other words, how do people know that you're children of God? Because you're accurately representing your Father by loving your enemies. Look at this. Why should we love our enemies? Because God loves his enemies. He does it through common grace. It says, for he makes, God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So God loves his enemies. How does he do it? He causes his son to shine on them too. He causes his rain to go on their crops as well. Verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? By the way, it's interesting. Who was recording these words? Matthew. What was Matthew's former occupation? A tax collector. But Jesus wasn't about to condone what Matthew did in his BC days. No, because tax collectors had real bad reputations and they should have real bad reputa repu re reputations because um, if you're new to the Bible, a tax collector was a Jewish man who went to work for the enemy, the Roman government, to take taxes from their brothers and sisters, the Jews, but then a lot of times, secretly, they'd raise the price of the, ta of the tax and then they would pocket the proceeds for themselves. He says in verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles, people who don't even care about God, do the same? You therefore must be perfect. Let's talk about spiritual completeness. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. All right, so how should we treat our enemies? If you're taking notes, here's your last kingdom citizen applicational point. Kingdom citizens should love their enemies. Now, the best example of this in Scripture is the son of David, Jesus Christ, who literally, later in Matthew's Gospel, will be slapped across the face and then <laughs> spit right in his face. And in fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 700 years B.C., like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. And then he prays for his enemies, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That's the best example of loving your enemies. But there's a, a second good example in the Bible, and I'm gonna end with this story. And it is the David in 1 Samuel. If you've never read 1 and 2 Samuel, you gotta go back and read those books, my favorite two Old Testament books. But there you have King Saul, the first king of Israel, and he hates this young upstart called David. He hates him so much, Saul tries to murder him several times. Saul is so insanely jealous of David. He has such a murderous rage against David. David has no choice. He has to flee. He has to go off into the wilderness and hide. While he's hiding, there's other people, because how many of you guys know when there's poor leadership in a nation, there's lots of discontented people? And so there's all these discontented people, and so what do they do? They're like, we're done with you, Saul, and they go to try to find David. And they go out to find David, and they find him hiding. And so these guys are literally, David and his mighty men, are hiding all over the Judean wilderness, and one day, they decide to hide in En Gedi. Now, En Gedi is a beautiful oasis in the desert. It's located on the western part of the Dead Sea. If you go with us to Israel, I will take you there to En Gedi. And man, it's absolutely gorgeous. En Gedi is famous for its seven beautiful waterfalls. Doesn't that look refreshing? 
And not only that, it's also known for its rocky cliffs. It's got so many caves everywhere. You can see the Dead Sea just off there in the distance. And En Gedi is also home of the Ibex. The first time I went to Israel many years ago, I drove up, the bus drove up into En Gedi, and I looked up and there's a goat in the tree. And I thought, I've never seen a goat in Florida in a tree. But this is what they do in Israel. And so um, this is an ibex, it's a wild goat, and they like to hang out in the trees around En Gedi. And so Saul hears that David is hiding in En Gedi, he picks 3,000 soldiers, and he goes to hunt this kid down. By the way, David, I think he ran from Saul for 10 years before he became king. And so those of you who are waiting for the fulfillment of God's will in your life, just know your tough times first, then you get the blessing. I don't know who that was for, that was for free. So, Saul arrives in En Gedi. King Saul arrives in En Gedi. And all of a sudden, his stomach starts to rumble and nature calls. That's what I love about the Bible, it just tells you like it is. So, Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself. And out of all those caves in En Gedi, he just happens to pick the one where David and his men are hiding. Is that a coincidence? No, it's a God of wins. He goes in there, and there he is. He's in the darkness. He's taking care of, well, I guess you can call it number two. And he's there, and David and his men are in the back of the cave, right? And David's men, discontented with Saul, don't want him on the throne of Israel anymore. So while Saul's on another throne, they're whispering to David, and they're saying, David, now's your chance. There he is. Look what the Lord has done. And David's like, shh. He took away your wife, McCall. He took away your best friend, Jonathan. Man, he's hunting you down like you're some kind of wild animal. End this now. And so David begins to slowly and carefully crawl quietly to King Saul, probably holding his nose as he's doing it. And he's getting closer, and he takes his knife, right? And instead of plunging it into his back, you guys remember what he does? He cuts off a piece of the king's robe. Sneaks back to his men. Saul's all done. He goes out. David comes out after he's a safe distance away from Saul. He grabs the piece of robe. He begins to wave it, and he yells out to Saul, my Lord, the king. Paul, Saul turns around. And it says that David said, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, See the corner of your robe in my hand? For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the Proverbs of the ancient says, out of the, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. David is just like, man, he's just like unloading now. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how you love your enemies, right there. That's how you love your enemies, right there. You don't take personal vengeance. We don't do that as Christians. You do your part, let God do his part. By the way, did you know that what God did? God took care of Saul. David never had to touch him. God took care of him. And he was slain by the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. And David became king of Judah and king of Israel. And so you do your part, let God do his part. I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but think about that person right now. 
You do your part, let God do his part. What is my part, pastor? You love them, you forgive them, and you pray for them. Thank you. Love them, forgive them, pray for them. And then God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And then, hopefully, they'll get saved if they're lost. And then instead of them receiving God's wrath, their substitute Jesus will receive God's wrath and they'll become your brother or sister in Christ. That's our heart. So what's our primary motivation for loving our enemies as ourselves? Here it is right here. But God shows his love for us in that while we were what? Christ died for us. Next verse. Since therefore we have now been justified by Jesus' blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Thank you, Jesus. Next verse. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So why in the world should we love our enemies? Because God, when we were his enemies, loved us. Why should I love my enemy, pastor? Because when you were God's enemy, he loved you. And he sent his one and only eternal son from heaven to earth. And that son, fully God, clothed himself with humanity and became fully man, fully God, fully man. He lived the life that you could not live. And then he died the death that you should have died. The wages of sin is death. But God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. He became your substitute. He took your crimes. You say, I haven't committed any crimes. Yes, you have. And so have I. Sin is a crime against heaven. You cannot get saved until you admit you're lost and you need Jesus and you need his payment in your behalf. That's how you get saved. You come to Christ, you turn from your sin the best way you know how, and you embrace Jesus as your king, as your Lord, as the savior of your life. And what happens? He washes you in his blood so that you'll never have to worry about the wrath of God. Yes, we can praise the Lord right now for Jesus. And so as the ministry team comes forward, Maybe you're here today and you never really heard it put that way. Maybe you're here today and your heart's been moved by the love of God for you, that he would pay for your sins on the cross and rise again the third day, victorious over sin, death, and hell, and now call you into a relationship with himself. And maybe you're here today and you wanna give your life to this king. You wanna give your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you, you're not sure if you die, you'll go to heaven. You're not sure if your sins are forgiven. You want to be sure. We can take care of that right now. So if you're in that group, you've never given your life to Jesus, but you want to. Or if you're in this group over here, and you know that you're a born-again Christian, but here's the thing. Right now, you're not living for the king. You're not living for the king, and you're reminded of his love for you, and that is motivating you to think, i got to rededicate my life to the king the rest of my life until my dying breath. I need to rededicate my life. So whether you're in this group or this group, let's take care of it right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Christianity is not a private matter. Christianity is a public matter. Jesus Christ was not embarrassed to hang half naked on a cross to pay for our redemption, and we should never be embarrassed about him. So if you're here today and you're in this group and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ the King, or you're in this group, you're a Christian, but you want to rededicate your life to the King, I want to ask you to just boldly stand up right now, whoever you are, and we'll take care of this. Just stand up who you are, wherever you are. Just stand up whoever you are. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Yep, just stand up whoever you are. Now. Just stand, stand and remain standing, okay? Stand and remain standing. It's so, so important that we, we, we 
don't listen to the voice of the enemy. Because right now, there's, there's two voices going on in some of your heads. And this voice is saying, don't listen to him. Get in the car. Get out of here. <laughs> and this voice is saying, I love you, son. I love you, daughter. Give your life to me. And so... One more opportunity. Anybody else want to join these brave people? Just stand to your feet. You want to give your life to the king, whoever you are. Whoever you are. Man, that takes a lot of courage. God bless you guys. I always have to do it, right? Where are the men? We, we need some more men to follow Christ and to lead their marriages and their families and their church. Guys, come on. Anybody else? All right, so, so everybody who's standing right now, and maybe some of you are watching, you could just stand up in your living room or wherever you are. If you're driving, do not stand up. Okay, so whoever you are, this is so, so serious. I don't know where you are spiritually. You may be coming back to the Lord or you may be going to him for the first time, but God knows your heart. And he, more important than anything, sees you standing for the king. So I'm gonna pray with you, but I, wanna, I want you to repeat the prayer. But don't repeat a poem. This is your prayer to Jesus, the King. And so church family, we're gonna support all these who are standing by praying out loud with them. Okay, and so let's all bow our heads. Just say something like this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve death and hell. But I thank you for your love that you came from heaven and earth to earth and went to a cross on my behalf. Thanks for being my substitute, my sacrifice, for paying for my sins in full. I trust you and you alone. I ask you to forgive me. I turn from my sin to you. Wash me with your blood. I confess you as king and help me to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. All right. Yeah.